So good evening and welcome to the fourth of the 2018 Darwin College Lectures on the theme of migration. Last week, you may recall, we, our speaker focused on the situation of migrants who end up being deported. Now, normally, we are able to make each week's lecture available to view online within a few days by the middle of the following week. But due to the complexity of last week's performance, we haven't been able to achieve that this week. We hope to have it available uh, ready during next week. So please accept our apologies. It will be on, online, but a little later than usual. Now, of course, in recent years, the night, nightly news has shown us very clearly the misery and the desperation of populations who've whose countries are in turmoil or riven by civil war. And those people are seeking to take their families to a safer place. Most find refuge in neighboring countries. Others, though, look further afield to countries that seem to offer the prospects of, of jobs and, and longer term security. And as we're now well aware, the, the attractions, those attractions also lead citizens of poor or unstable countries to undertake very perilous journeys in the hope of finding a better life. And the suffering and the tragedies that result as traffickers and smugglers prey on the desperate and the hopeful seem almost unstoppable. We tend to take the safety and security and social supports of our Western democracies pretty much for granted. But when you think about it, it's no wonder that outsiders should desire what we have here. But really, until searing poverty is eradicated and populations have hope and peace and, and jobs in their, own, in their own homelands, the desire to move somewhere better will not diminish. It's human nature. So tonight, to talk on these issues, we have the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, whose long career has been devoted to international refugee and humanitarian work. Indeed, just this very week, I've just learned, he celebrated his 30th anniversary of working with the United Nations. So please welcome Philippa Grandi, who will speak to us on refugees and migration. Philippa. Good evening. Let me tell you about two young Eritrean women, Mariam and Semira. We'll call them like that. They were born and grew up in Eritrea, a country which they describe as beautiful, but where, I quote, security and hope are scarce for most people. In Eritrea, military service is compulsory. And in practice, for many, extends for decades on end. Mariam and Semira, because girls do military service as well, like tens of thousands of young Eritreans before them, escaped after five years of service their request for demobilization having been denied. They embarked on a dangerous journey through Sudan, where they first met, and across the border to Libya, traveling at high speed on pickup trucks for a month through the harsh desert, watching others fall off and die of injuries or thirst themselves surviving on biscuits and water. This is a true story. Once inside Libya, they were put into what they describe as a, I quote, people's store, a holding pen run by an armed group 
where people were squeezed into small spaces on top of each other in atrocious conditions, no hygiene facilities, no air, no natural light for months. Together with others held there, they were repeatedly, repeatedly tortured so that they would be obliged to seek money for their release from their families. Even those able to raise the money from their families or through charity at home were then transferred to other group after having paid the money, where the process of ransom would start again. The two women were kidnapped and sold between three groups of smugglers during their time in Libya. I repeat, it's a true story based on two real cases. After some time, Mariam, Semira, and six other women were taken from their people's store and taken to Misrata, a city on the Libyan coast. They thought they might finally make it across the sea to Europe. Instead, they were separated from the other women and for two weeks locked in a room together and repeatedly raped. Their rapists wore masks, so it was impossible to know what they looked like or even how many they were. Two weeks off in their own words, staring at the door, and not knowing whose turn it was to be assaulted next. Two weeks of fear, shame, and sustained brutal sexual violence. When it came to an end, they were once more crammed into, into another people's store, but eventually managed to escape through the window of a toilet. Overcoming terror, they sought refuge in a mosque where they were handed over to the police, arrested and transferred to a government detention center in Tripoli. There they found themselves again in indefinite captivity in a deeply fractured country affected by widespread insecurity in the hands of a government with very limited authority and almost no capacity to exercise its responsibilities. It's a horrific story, as I'm sure you all agree, and regrettably one that reflects the experiences of tens of thousands of women, men, children, who make the journey across the Sahel through North Africa towards Europe every year. Some are refugees, driven by violence in Somalia and other countries, blighted by deep-rooted conflict or like Mariam and Semira, by state repression and persecution, moving in search of safety and the solution to their plight. Others are propelled forward by a complex mix of factors, poor governance, deep-seated inequality, resource scarcity, food insecurity, social and economic exclusion, stall development, a collapse of traditional livelihoods and the consequences of climate change, which in combination are driving migration in search of better opportunities as well as fueling in turn the conflicts that lead to refugee flows. But regardless of how we categorize people on the move through Libya, and that categorization is important, I'll go back to it, but regardless of that for now, the same question forces itself into our consciousness. How, in a world of modern nation states, shared prosperity and boundless capabilities, can people today still find themselves repeatedly exposed to the horrors of kidnapping for ransom, of imprisonment, of torture and rape that Mariam, Samira, and countless others experience? What is wrong with our modern system of international cooperation so painstakingly built from the ashes of the Second World War in pursuit of peace 
security, human rights, and development. That it is so badly failing, this system, so many of those who are moving in search of safety, stability, and simply opportunity across the globe. And most importantly, how can and should the world respond? In reflecting on those questions, my lecture this evening will focus on the intersection between refugee movement, movements and the broader dynamics of human mobility and migration today. I'm very grateful to Professor Fowler and to Darwin College, and in particular, Dr. Posket and Dr. Knolle, and all those that have cooperated to organize this lecture for giving me this opportunity. It is indeed a particularly urgent issue, and I'm very happy that the chosen theme for this year's lecture has been migration from different angles. In September 2016, a year and a half ago, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the not very well known New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants, a series of political commitments to which heads of states, all of them around the world, signed up aimed at delivering a more coherent and comprehensive response to large-scale population flows. Among other things, the declaration called for the development of two global compacts, one on safe, orderly, and regular migration, and one on refugees, to be, to be adopted in 2018. We're working on that right now. The zero drafts, the first drafts of the two compacts were issued this week. So it's a significant week and an intensive period of consultations is about to begin. UNHCR, my organization, the UN Refugee Organization, is developing the refugee compact in consultation, of course, with states. It's going to be their compact and other stakeholders drawing extensively on experience in our field operations for the past uh, six and a half decades. We work directly with refugees. We work with internally displaced people and stateless people in 130 countries around the world. Now, refuge and the protection of exiles are matters intimately intertwined with our history. I'm sure you all know that, but they even bear some relevance to the history of Cambridge University. Founded, I hope I'm not making a mistake here, I realize I should have checked in 1209 by scholars fleeing persecution in Oxford, <laughs> overcoming interesting initial hostility from the local community they were accused of creating disturbances and scapegoated for crimes. They were later granted protection by Henry III and the long and distinguished history of this university took its course. It's an interesting story if you think about it. It also echoes what we see in many parts of the world today as local tensions intersect with wider regional global power struggles to drive and shape forced displacement and refugee outflows. The move to seek refuge here in Cambridge took place at a time when the power struggle between the church and secular authority in Europe was fueling conflict across the continent and was being instrumentalized to mobilize persecution on the basis of religion, gender, and other forms of identity. And the rejection, rejection of those early scholars by local Cambridge townspeople has echoes in the hurdles that refugees and migrants face in integrating in new communities today. That's just some food for thought. Closer to us, in 1950, when the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, my office, was established 
the distinction between refugees and migrants was fairly clear. The first High Commissioner who hailed from Holland, my predecessor, Gerrit Jan van Hoeven Gotthard, a journalist and politician who had been active in the resistance during the Second World War, um, had been ac uh, described the dozen or so million people at that time who were left scattered in Europe after the war, far from their homes and countries, and said, I quote, that this was not a movement of people tracking with their families and chattels from one destination to another, but the movement of uprooted individuals, single uprooted individuals. By 1953, three years into the existence of our organization, around seven of, the, of that dozen million had been repatriated. And one million had found homes in new countries. So in surveying the task ahead, my predecessor noted that resettlement opportunities for the remaining refugees were narrowing and set out proposals for their assimilation in the communities in Europe where they were living, with a particular focus on economic integration, a successful project back then that led to UNHCR being awarded the first Nobel Peace Prize the, fo the following year. Fast forward to 2017, to last year, the categorizations that characterized the post-war years are still relevant, but sometimes less evident. Still relevant, less evident. However, this is important. Refugees do not move out of choice. They are forced from their countries in search of safety, owing to conflict, violence, and persecution. When more than a half a million ethnic Rohingya fled from Myanmar, from Burma, to Bangladesh in the space of a month last September, as you all recall, there could be no illusion that they were moving voluntarily in search of a better life. The same applies to the approximately two, two and a half million South Sudanese who have fled vicious fighting in their country over the last four years, or the five and a half million Syrian refugees scattered across the Middle East and beyond. The flow of refugees, alas, is not quote unquote orderly, a word that is invoked so often by politicians these days. It cannot often or ever be orderly. Fleeing for their lives, their movement is often chaotic and improvised. Their assets left behind and they are rarely able to cross borders through regular immigration procedures. Millions more remain internally displaced within their own countries. For most of the world's migrants, on the other hand, it is hope, expectation, rather than despair that motivate their decision to move, although conditions might be very tough, even from their perspective. The vast majority of what is estimated to be almost 250 million people living outside their country of birth today have moved through regular migration channels. Their decisions shaped by migration policies and labor demands in destination countries rather than war, repression, and violence at home. And while the absolute number of international migrants is higher than ever before, as a proportion of the world's population at 3.4%, it has increased only marginally since the 1960s. In short, migration is an intrinsic inevitable aspect of social and economic development and not a problem to be solved. And yet, the causes in which conflict and persecution take root and flourish often overlap with factors that shape migration flows. Weak governance, impoverishment, deep inequalities, environmental degradation, lack of resources, water scarcity and food insecurity. 
climate change, as I said, is an increasingly prominent driver in which, uh, of many of these trends. And in a world in which greater overall prosperity has been accompanied by deepening inequality, as documented by, for example, Thomas Piketty and others in the 2018 World Inequality Report, um, it is precisely those most affected by lack of development who, even, when, even if they can find the means to move, are likely to be excluded from legal channels and compelled to embark on irregular migration pathways. In addition, for those countries that are transitioning out of conflict and may have in the past generated refugee outflows, human mobility may emerge as an important coping mechanism linked to poor governance, collapsed economies, and the lack of jobs and services. The phenomenon, therefore, of what we call, in a bit of jargon, mixed migra migratory flows has become increasingly prominent. With refugees and migrants, we maintain that distinction, however, moving together, often across spaces on land and at sea in which power is frequently exercised not by the state, but by parallel forms of authority that have filled governance vacuums, including transnational armed groups and smuggling and trafficking networks, as Professor Fowler mentioned. In other regions, including parts of Europe today, the overriding political logic of deterrence and control and the heavy apparatus of enforcement that goes with this forces migrants and refugees beyond the reach of the state, propelling them into exploitative situations and dangerous journeys across mountains, deserts, and seas. The refugee dimension of these flows varies. In some cases, for example, the surge of arrivals in Europe by boat in the eastern Mediterranean in 2015, the vast majority were refugees. In others, including those risking their lives clinging to trains across northern Central America and crossing the Bay of Bengal and the Andaman Sea by boat, the composition is much more mixed. The current movements through sub-Saharan Africa into Libya, on which Mariam and Samira embarked, consist primarily of migrants with a smaller but significant refugee component. Yet once on these journeys, the risks to which refugees and migrants are exposed are often the same. As we were starkly reminded in the case of the 30 Somalis and Ethiopians who drowned after their boat capsized on the way from southern Yemen to Djibouti last week, and the loss of 90 lives off the coast of Libya just a few days ago. The growing number of unaccompanied and separated children making these journeys is also of deep concern, a phenomenon which we have documented in a number of regions over the last few years, from Central America to the overland route taken by young Afghans across Central Asia to Europe to the Eastern and Central Mediterranean routes. Of the 119,000 people who arrived on Italy's shores last year, 13%, that's a large number, were children unaccompanied by an adult or separated by their, from their families. Despite the complex dynamics driving today's population flows and the common dangers to which so many of those on the move are exposed, it remains critical to avoid blurring the lines between refugees and migrants. Refugees, as we said, move because of a failure of protection in their own countries. They have fled war, violence, and persecution. Many have been displaced inside their own countries first or have been trapped in enclaves or besieged areas, sometimes for years. Returning home, without a resolution of the conflict or repression that drove them from their countries in the first place is not usually an option. Deprived of the protection of their own governments, refugees 
are considered, must be considered, of international concern. And the obligation to provide international protection lies at the heart of the 1951 Refugee Convention, for which my organization, I, in fact, exercise a supervisory role, as well as its 1967 protocol and later regional instruments. It is important to understand the background to this framework. The first mechanisms for international cooperation to address the situation of refugees were, in, were established by the League of Nations in the years between the two world wars. International protection was extended then to specific groups, including Russians, Armenians, and Assyrians who were outside their states of origin and were politically excluded and marginalized. Impoverished and denied the possibility to return home, the introduction of the Nansen passport in 1922 enabled many to move onwards to join family and pursue labor opportunities in new countries, including through schemes administered by the International Labor Office. Nansen passports were eventually recognized back then by 52 governments. Facilitating refugees' freedom of movement operated as a form, we would say today, of international burden sharing. And migration became part of the solution. But international protection was the cornerstone on which those solutions were ultimately built. However, by the 1930s, as the impact of the Great Depression hits and new political trends emerged, both asylum and migration frameworks effectively collapsed. Without international cooperation to ensure protection, increasingly restrictive state-by-state -state immigration policies proved a devastatingly inadequate response to the tragedy of Nazi Germany. Solidarity failed, and as a result, millions perished because they were unable, unable to flee the Third Reich or were not given asylum, leaving a stain on the world's collective conscience that we would be well advised to recall today when the very principles of international refugee protection are being called into question, including by some of its traditional champions in Europe, where the Holocaust unfolded. It was this experience that drove the United Nations after the Second World War in one of its earliest acts to adopt a resolution recognizing refugees as a matter of international concern in December 1946 and to the international protection mandate entrusted to my organization just a few years later. The inability of refugees to return home because of conflict or persecution and the failure of national protection are at the heart of their specific status and the internationally agreed framework of rights and obligation that applies. Treating them as a subgroup of irregular migrants risks obscuring their distinct status and rights in international law and facilitates an approach in which control takes precedence over protection. Coming from countries affected by conflict violence and for some violent extremism and terrorism, failure to pay attention to the causes of their flight and the reasons why they, were, they have been forced into traveling through illegal means also risks their being perceived as a potential security threat rather than people who in fact have fled insecurity in search of refuge. It is also important to recall that in fact the, mass, the vast majority of refugees are hosted in countries neighboring their own and don't move further afield. Our latest figures for mid-2017 show 
a global total of some 24 million refugees, of whom more than 20 million are hosted in developing countries, not developed countries, developing countries. Seven countries, seven countries out of 193 host almost two-thirds of the world's refugees, and none of them, of those countries, are in the high or upper middle income brackets. Compare, for example, the one million refugees who in 2015 arrived in Europe with a combined population of half a billion people to the one million refugees who have fled from South Sudan to just one country, Uganda, with a local population of just 43 million. The vast majority of refugees are not on the move, but in fact struggling to survive in countries bordering their own, trying to rebuild their lives in anticipation of the day when they will hopefully be able to return home. With effective conflict resolution, increasingly a rarity, for many that day becomes more and more distant, unfortunately. Around the world today, tens of thousands of refugees every moment are weighing the difficult choice between staying in tough circumstances in exile or returning home to a still risky situation often amidst widespread destruction. When protection fails or the prospect of a solution back home fades, the decision to move in search of greater protection and stability becomes also more likely. The movement of Syrian refugees towards Europe coincided with a moment in which food rations in Lebanon and Jordan were being cut. Only 50% of refugee children were in primary school for lack of resources, and the war in Syria had entered a new, devastating, and hopeless phase. It is also no coincidence that two of the world's global refugee populations, frequently to be found in mixed migratory movements, are Somalis and Afghans, both from fragile countries where opportunities remain few. Turning again to Mariam and Samira, in choosing not to remain in the refugee camps in Eastern Sudan, where they could have stayed, they would have been profoundly aware of the bleak prospects of a life stretching ahead there, confined to a camp that was established up to 50 years ago with no prospects to work or build a future and exposed to the many risks associated with long-term confinement, frustration, and lack of hope. They may also have been aware of a string of in incidents of abductions and disappearances of Eritrean refugees there, allegedly involving border tribes, held for ransom or trafficked onwards for the purpose of forced marriage, sexual exploitation, or bonded labor, as well as reports of attacks and deportations. Approaching refugees purely through an immigration lens obscured this broader context and the reasons that force refugees to flee. It allows irresponsible, unscrupulous political leaders to exploit genuine public concerns generated by haphazard and reactive responses to refugee flows. And the practice, so common, of branding refugees as illegal immigrants or otherwise avoiding the refugee terminology and the rights and obligation that it implies is one which some large refugee hosting countries have closely watched from afar, if not emulated. I have taken some time to set out the background to today's refugee flows and why it is important that the international refugee protection regime remains at the forefront of the international response. Yet, as we have already seen, there is an important intersection between refugee protection and migration, especially in mixed flows. The causes are often intertwined. They may be exposed to the same appalling risks en route, and as they progress towards their eventual destinations, they face the same consequences of xenophobia, nationalist sentiment, and dehumanization in general. 
Addressing the situation of people on the move and protecting their rights and welfare calls for a range of responses, some common to all, some differentiated according to status and protection needs. What then are the fundamental considerations that should shape our response to all people on the move and especially those traveling in today's mixed flows? First and foremost, protecting the lives and dignity of all must be at the center of the response. Rescue at sea, for example, is a humanitarian imperative as well as a binding obligation. In 2015, UNHCR, the International Maritime Organization and the International Chamber of Shipping, issued guidelines for conducting search and rescue operations in line with international legal standards. But for this to be truly effective, states need to share responsibility for deploying search and rescue operations and disembarking those rescued, either on a temporary basis until they can be evacuated onwards or helped to return home, or by admitting them into their own asylum procedures. Alternatively, and especially in exceptional circumstances when mixed migratory routes converge, in the Mediterranean, for example, regional mechanisms to relocate those disembarked could significantly alleviate the pressure on those countries most affected. Last year, for example, more than two-thirds of the 172,000 people arriving by sea in Europe were disembarked in Italy with the remainder split more or less equally between Greece and Spain. As in 2015, when the bulk of the arrivals reached Germany, Sweden, and Austria, European solidarity and burden sharing failed to materialize, leaving a few countries to bear the brunt of the situation. Second, misconception and myths around refugees and migrants must be challenged and countered. This must be done more vigorously, especially by governments and leaders that often appear frightened by populist rhetoric. It must also rest on evidence-based reporting and policy making. Let me mention a few of those misconceptions. It's interesting. I've already flagged that while migration is increasing in absolute terms, the number of those living outside their own countries as a proportion of the global population has remained at more or less the same level for the last 60 years. Around half of migrants globally have moved from developing to developed regions. But there is also a sizable south, south movement, with one-third of the world's migrants having moved from one developing country to another. Similarly, why the proliferation of armed conflict that we observe today has resulted in a massive upsurge in forced displacement and the persistence of perpetual refugee situations that show little prospect of being resolved the impact is overwhelmingly absorbed by the developing world. Of the 66 million refugees and displaced people around the world today, more than two-thirds are then internally displaced within the borders of their own countries, unable to leave owing to uh, restrictive border policies or because of the brutal way in which today's world are waged, with little regards for the lives of civilians this means that their paths to safety for most of them is blocked. And while the number of refugees worldwide is approaching the levels of the 90s, as an overall percentage of the world's population, it remains somehow, somehow lower at 0.2% comparing to 0.3% in the 90s. The desperate situation of the world's refugees and the pressures on the countries hosting them compel international attention and support, but this is achievable. It is not a matter that, it, that is beyond our shared capabilities, provided that states collectively step up to the challenge. Migration and refugee flows are therefore not out of control as some politicians would like us to believe. However, poor management and reactive improvised, piecemeal responses, and inadequate integration measures can give the impression that this is the case. As we have seen in the European Union over the last few years, this can foster genuine fears 
regarding jobs, identity, and security, which are easily manipulated to allow xenophobia and racism to flourish, including, and sometimes especially, in those countries that have, in reality, received the smallest numbers. Third, responses to mixed migratory movements must be based on a real understanding of what is driving and shaping these flows. And the comprehensive response that engages with these elements in all their complexity, this is not a simple matter as it is somehow presented, sometimes presented. This means listening to refugees and migrants themselves, to the governments and communities in countries that host the bulk of the refugees and through which they transit, and understanding the local political economies that allow trafficking, smuggling, and the small arms trade to flourish. An imbalanced emphasis on closed border, containment, and deterrence, as I have said, what one analyst has called violent humanitarianism, as the response to the abuses perpetrated by traffickers and smugglers is not the answer. It simply drives refugees and migrants further into the hands of those who seek to exploit and abuse them. The more opportunities for people to mig migrate regularly, including through migration schemes that meet labor market needs, the less need for them to move irregularly. Certainly, strong collective action is needed to tackle the horrific abuses perpetrated by traffickers and to identify and prosecute them. Important initiatives have been undertaken by many organizations. UNHCR has made specific recommendations to tackle trafficking, including by freezing assets, travel bans, disrupting the supply of revenues and materials, robust prosecutions and sanctions against well-known senior figures and companies engaged in trafficking. Action, however, in spite of all the talk, has been very limited so far. And as we're seeing now in, in Niger, in the Agadez region of northern Nigeria, the border with Libya, hard security measures supported by the international community to control flows can create instability if they are not matched with adequate development investments that provide a, le a real alternative to the smuggling industry, which is estimated to have offered over there in that region direct jobs for more than 6,000 people in a very poor region. And this industry has, indirect, has been of indirect benefit to more than half of all households in the city of Agadez. So you need alternatives to that if you want to counter it properly. They may also expose these measures, refugees and migrants, to greater danger at the cost of journeys. As the cost of journeys goes up, uh, the risk of being abandoned in the desert is heightened, with more vehicle breakdowns as smugglers take less traveled routes to evade more strict law enforcement. It's a complex issue. For refugees fleeing for their own lives, a comprehensive approach, a comprehensive approach is needed that addresses conditions in countries of origin, neighboring countries, and countries of transit. Strengthening refugee protection and offering solutions along the routes, including in countries such as Chad, Niger, Libya, is key. For this to work, partnership across region and institution is critical. I referred earlier to the New York Declaration, a document which, as I said, is not widely known, but is important. It proposes a more comprehensive and effective refugee response model based on sharing responsibility with refugee hosting states, big ones, the seven countries and others, through forms of support that move beyond humanitarian aid and into early investments in solutions. We are applying this model already in a dozen countries and in two regional situations, in East Africa and in Central America, with a particular focus on shifting away from camps, encampments, and fostering the inclusion of refugees 
in local communities and economies until they need to stay in exile. Development investments are integral to this new model. The World Bank, for the first time, has been heavily involved and is rolling out important, substantive, new financial instruments for refugee hosting countries. And the number are of bilateral development agency, including the Department of International Development here in the UK, are also engaged. And there is also an important role for development and supporting the drive for solutions in countries of origin by addressing the causes of conflict and fragility. This comprehensive model, which I've described in very simple terms, but is quite elaborate, has enormous potential. And if properly resourced and applied, including in protracted refugee situations, can also help obviate the needs of refuge for refugees to embark on dangerous onward journeys at the mercy of smugglers. The model also incorporates an important focus on pursuing political solution, that's the key, and the resolution of conflict inside countries of origin to enable refugees to return home. It also has an important emphasis on providing solutions beyond countries of first asylum, a point that I will return to in a moment. It is already being applied with some success to address, as I said, the mixed migratory movements in Central America with the US and Canada as cooperating actors. A fourth area regards investments in strengthening protection and support and for refugees and their host in host countries and along routes. And this must be matched by access to protection and humane treatment wherever they find themselves, including in destination countries. UNHCR has issued guidance on how to respond to these situations in a protection-sensitive manner, including on how best to facilitate entry and reception, using screening mechanisms and differentiated procedures to channel people into appropriate processes so that asylum systems don't become overwhelmed, which is a key problem that we're facing today. This includes practical mechanisms for identifying including biometric me mechanisms to, uh, for identifying and protecting refugees and migrants with specific needs, including unaccompanied and separated children, survivor of sexual and gender-based violence, people with disabilities, victims of trafficking. Migrants as well as refugees may find themselves in vulnerable situations requiring protection and assistance given the circumstances they encounter during their journeys or in destination countries, or because of their individual characteristics or traumatic experiences. The human rights of all those in vulnerable situations needs fundamentally to be respected, and their immediate and specific needs met, need to be met. In certain cases, even people who do not fall within the scope of the refugee definition may therefore be granted permission to remain in the countries where they arrive for compassionate or practical reasons. Think of the many Nigerian women that get regularly trafficked out of their country. The 1951 convention has proven to be a resilient and adaptable instrument applicable to situations and form of persecution not explicitly envisaged at the time of its drafting, such as those related to gender, age, sexual orientation, gang violence. These are newer aspects of the phenomenon that we're taking into account now. Those fleeing armed conflict and other violent crises generally fall squarely within the convention scope. And in some parts of the world, the convention has been complemented and reinforced by regional instruments. Arrangements for the return and readmission to their country of people who do not qualify for international protection or meet under entry requirements are also an important part of a well-functioning management system as well as a credible asylum process. 
wherever possible, voluntary return should be pursued, accompanied by support for reintegration back in their country. These are not refugees, these are migrants. And in all cases, returns should be carried out in accordance to human rights standards. I mention this because it is a widely debated issue at the moment. And last and most importantly, when all this is said and done, we must strive to restore a sense of solidarity. Over the years, there have been important examples in which energy, creativity, and political commitment have converged and states have collectively mobilized to address large-scale displacement crisis through a range of instruments, including the transfer of refugees from one country to the other. States joined together, for example, to resettle Hungarian refugees in 1956, to respond to the Indo-Chinese crisis, include through an innovative orderly departure scheme from their country of origin, Vietnam, and to address the successive outflows from the former Yugoslavia in the 90s. Refugee resettlement has remained an important instrument, allowing for refugees with particular protection needs, including women at risk and survivors of torture, to be resettled to third countries where they and their families are able to build a future. Yet, while the number of places available rose steadily over much of the current decade, and the growing number of states have been engaged, including the United Kingdom, the number of refugees resettled annually has remained well under 1% of the global total, a relatively insignificant number. Following a sharp reduction in the number of places made available by the United States most recently, the United States traditionally a global leader on resettlement, the number of refugees able to benefit from our resettlement referrals dropped by more than 50% to, to 75,000 in, in 2017. We're down to half percent of the world refugee population that wealthy countries take from poorer countries, in simple words. In another example of how migration and refugee protection intersect, resettlement opportunities could and should be complemented in the migration field by labor migration, family reunion, scholarships, and other uh, schemes. This is not a new idea. Migration schemes were a key aspect in international efforts in, supported, in support of that predecessor of mine, High Commissioner van Hoeven Gotthards, to resolve the situation of millions who displaced, were displaced in Europe after the war in the early 50s. And there are a number of initiatives underway or in development. Their scope remains limited for now, but if it is brought to scale, it could provide a powerful tool for international responsibility sharing in support of refugee hosting states. There is quite simply no other way to address the phenomena of large-scale refugee flows and mixed migration except, and this is the gist of my message tonight, through international cooperation. In the case of Libya, this is now finally being pursued after CNN issued the dramatic documentary that many of you will have seen calling for an emergency response to the dramatic situation of refugees and migrants there. In that case, that international cooperation is now finally being pursued through a task force established between the EU, the UN, and the African Union to address the migrant situation in Libya. And as a result of that, finally, the International Organization of Migration, our sister agency dealing with migration, stepped up its efforts to facilitate, finally, the voluntary return of migrants from Libya to their home countries. They've helped already more than 13,000 to go back to date. And we, UNHCR, secured the release of over 1,700 detained asylum seekers, refugees, in 2017. And 
Starting last November, we embarked on a major effort to relocate asylum seekers and refugees out of detention centers in Libya, those where the two uh, girls I spoke about were detained, to emergency evacuation facilities in other countries, in particular Niger. This is an enormously complex, dangerous, but life-saving exercise which involves the cooperation of a number of states. But, so if we're serious about addressing mixed migratory flows, resettlement and other pathways for admission to other countries must figure more prominently as part of this comprehensive response. In September, to give you an example, I called for an additional 40,000 resettlement places for 15 priority countries in Africa which constitute what we call the Central Mediterranean route. 40,000 resettlement places to help ease this phenomenon. To date, 17,000 places have been pledged. This is encouraging, but clearly not nearly enough. So let me conclude. When Mariam and Samira were in the government detention center in Libya, where we left them a few moments ago, they came to the UNHCR of a UNH, they came to the attention of a UNHCR protection team who negotiated, literally, negotiated with the local uh, groups and authorities their release and finally managed to arrange for their evacuation from Libya to Niger in December last year. They were flown to Niamey, the capital of Niger, along with 72 other refugees and asylum seekers who had been stuck in Somalia in similar situations, mainly Somalis and Eritreans, most of them children under 18. They're all now in a guest house in Niger, supported by UNHCR and other organizations, and waiting to hear what the future holds, of them, holds for them, but safe and protected. When my colleagues spoke to them last week, they shared their relief at finally having escaped the traumatic situation that they had endured for so long. I quote, we just want to close the door on this experience and move on to a new and peaceful life. I quote again, we don't want much just to be educated so that we can work to help our families. And we want to be safe. Their words and the hope and expectations of those two young women need no further comment. Simply put, we cannot let them down. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for coming to speak to us. I mean, the numbers you have given are almost unimaginable. I was struck by 24 million refugees in the world and that 20 million of those are in neighboring countries. And that two thirds of the world's refugees are in just seven countries, and that those are poor countries. I had no idea that really the problem was quite so severe. I think it's, that's one thing that's particularly shameful, that seven countries, seven poor countries, are hosting 80%, if the num I understood the numbers correctly, um, of the world's refugees. There's a message for all of us in w rich countries. I was encouraged, though, to hear about the, this uh, New York Declaration and to hear that you know, intensive negotiations are starting. And I just hope that all our governments can put their political differences aside so that 
in the future, refugees and migrants will be protected and the, the host countries will be recognized and protected and that more countries will recognize what they need to do to help. So really this week has, it's the fourth week uh, in this lecture series when we've looked at aspects of migration of peoples. Next week, we turn to migration of disease, disease migration. When Professor Eva Harris from the University of California, Berkeley, will talk to us about the Zika and dengue viruses. And we hope to see you then. But before we all go, we really need to thank Filippo Grandi. Thank you very, very much indeed for taking the time to come to speak to us and to say that we are immensely grateful for all that you and all your colleagues in the UNHCR are doing on our behalf. Thank you. <laughs>